joining us on this week's episode of Creature Teachers. I'd like to welcome Rick Ross from Creature Teachers in Littleton. And today we're learning all about animals of North America. What do we have? Well, these are animals that you could actually find in your backyard. Um, I don't think we brought anything today that you would not see in your backyard. And so we're going to, to try and introduce you to some of these things. Um, when we started doing this program, we, we didn't know that it was going to be such a success, but it has turned out to be. And I think the reason is that these are animals that you might see, but when you see them, they are jumping across the driveway or running into the woods, or you don't get a chance to really see them up close. So what we do is we'll bring them around and let you see them uh, up close. And um, uh, the first one we're going to bring today, you might have seen kind of running around in my pocket a little bit here. <laughs> Um, this is Holly, and Holly is a flying squirrel. So, how many people have seen a flying squirrel? Okay, one, two, a few. Okay, well, that's good. How many people see gray squirrels? Pretty much everybody. I bet we could go outside right now and find a gray squirrel. Gray squirrels are all over the place. But in many places, and here's something that you probably don't know, in many places, there are more flying squirrels than gray squirrels around. Huh. And the reason we don't see them, in the trees. Yeah, they're in the trees and they're nocturnal. And so we don't see them very often. And I don't know if you remember from our last program that we were talking about creature teachers and how we don't like to take any animals out of the wild. And so mm. when we decided that we were going to use flying squirrels, we had to find some place that actually raised flying squirrels. Couldn't find any place local, <laughs> but we found a place in Texas that raised squirrel, flying squirrels. And so we called them up and we got two flying squirrels and we had them shipped to us. Well, we had to actually get a plane ticket for these flying squirrels. So, yeah, that's right. They had to put the, fl the flying squirrels on a plane and sent them to us and we got them home. Now, when I did get them home, um, I got home and I'm sitting on my couch and I'm kind of playing with these flying squirrels <laughs> going, they're really neat. And I heard something up in my attic. And so I got a flashlight and I went up there and I shined the light. And what do you think I saw? Flying yeah, squirrels. there were about 20 flying squirrels up in my attic. They were all over the place Beautiful. in my attic. And my wife said to me, why didn't you just grab some of those flying squirrels in the attic? Why did you have to order them? And of course I said, well, I don't want to take any animals out of the wild. And she did remind me their attic is not the wild. But uh, at any rate, we got uh, a couple of them. And this one was actually given to us from a friend of mine. Um, he had her for about three years. And one thing that we find with flying squirrels is they tend to bond to one person. But we were very lucky in that um, she took to me and she's been a very very nice flying squirrel to me unfortunately she doesn't like too many other people Aww. and she has a tendency to um, jump on my wife from my pocket and bite her and then jump back in my pocket again, <laughs> which my wife doesn't like too much so she's mm -hmm. always looking to make sure that my pockets not moving when I'm walking around but you'll see that she is loving this banana. And it's not like she would eat bananas in the wild, obviously. We don't have bananas around here. But flying squirrels are pretty widespread throughout the United States. You're going to find this kind. This is a southern flying squirrel. Mm. There are 10 different subspecies of southern flying squirrel. Really? But there's only one northern flying squirrel. And if you see one of these, and he looks larger than this, and he's got a little bit different structure to his face, probably a northern flying squirrel, because we find more of those around here than southern flying squirrels. Um, now this, uh, this onesie pajama that she's wearing. <laughs> very, very good way to put that. Um, and let's see if we can see that on her, because it's one of the really unique adaptations that these flying squirrels have. If we look at her, we will see that she's got this flap of skin that goes from her front foot to her back foot right mm -hmm. here. And you can see this. There's a name for it. It's called a patagium. That's and it allows her to be able to jump and glide. And of course, you have sugar gliders, so you know this too, because sugar gliders have the same thing. One of the unique features that these guys have that sugar gliders do not have is this really neat flat tail. And if we can see that flat tail there, we'll notice that Very cool. it has a bone in it, just like your sugar glider's tail. But all of the hair goes out like this, That's and cool. it creates a way for her to be able to kind of move when she's gliding. So if she jumped out of a tree and, and she was headed to another tree that had an owl in it, she's not gonna wanna land oh, in that no. tree because she doesn't wanna get eaten by the owl. So she is going to be able to move with this tail to another tree. There's another feature that you might notice about her and it kind of gives her away. <laughs> and that is her big, huge eyes. She has these wonderful, and I don't know if I can hold her still enough here to get a shot of her big eyes. Uh -huh. But if we can see that she has these wonderful, huge eyes, and this allows her to be able to see well at night. The bigger her eyes are, the more light it's going to let in. 
more light it lets in, the better she can see at night. So she's very good. And she also does like my pocket a lot. <laughs> she will go back into my pocket. One of the things I like about her is that we had her out in a field one time. She jumped off my shoulders, ran into the woods, and climbed up a big, huge pine tree. And I thought I'd never see her again. Well, about five minutes later, we all looked up, and there she was in the top of the tree. She climbed down, jumped on my shoulder, went into my pocket, and fell asleep. <laughs> so I don't know whether she really likes me or she decided that I was the one who fed her. So that's probably more likely. Where are you going? No, don't go in my shirt. <laughs> no, no, you're not going in there. I think she wants to talk into the microphone. Yes. All right. So she is really, really she's cool. So this is as big her? as she gets. You can pet her. You can see how yeah. soft she's. She's very, very. She is very <laughs> soft. She's yeah. very, very soft. Yes, she like is. Like a hamster. But yes, quite like a hamster. Yep. And she is a rodent too. She is. Um, yes. And one of the things that a lot of people, when they see a flying squirrel, they think that it's a they sugar glider. They think marsupial. But sugar gliders are actually a marsupial. marsupial. And marsupials, of course, are those animals that have a pouch. These guys do not. These are more closely related to a rat or a squirrel or a chipmunk than um, to a sugar glider. So they'll glider. have a litter of babies rather than one yes, or two Yes, actually, every yeah, that's true. Year. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think? Oh, the other thing you might have noticed is that <laughs> I have to keep her in a little have a heart trap. Um, and this is because she can chew out of anything uh, that's plastic. And I found that out when I was coming back from a show on the Cape one time. It was about 9 o'clock at night. And I was driving along in the dark, and something jumped on my head. It turned out that it was her, but mm -hmm. in my car, it could be just about anybody. So um, I panicked a little bit, but she wound up just kind of running around my car for two hours. And then when I got home, she went in my pocket and fell asleep. <laughs> so she is a very nice little creature. What a good girl. All right. We'll put her back in there. We'll find out what else we have here. I did notice <clears throat> that there were some people in the front row that were kind of covering their nose yeah. a little bit because they smelled something. And I think we're going to find out what that animal is. This is why the front row was covering their nose. All right. This is double stuff. And double stuff, double stuff is a wonderful, wonderful animal. However, we all know that he's a skunk. And now I see people in the second row doing the same thing here. You may smell him. You may go, oh my goodness, he smells like a skunk. He has been descented. That means he cannot spray you. But he still smells like a skunk. And do you know why? Because he's in the weasel family. Because he's a skunk. Yeah. And he is. You are correct. He is in the weasel family. That's called the mustelids, and the mustelids all have that smell. If you're familiar with ferrets yes, at all, a lot of people, okay, mm -hmm. and a lot of people will say, "Oh, ferrets are stinky animals too." Not so much. Just happens to be <laughs> that they have a bit of a smell to them, he's and so soft. he still smells like a skunk a bit. All right, um, Double Stuff's been with us for about six years now. Um, he's rather large. And what <laughs> happens with skunks in captivity, <laughs> they have a tendency to get rather large. I think they just are, they become couch potatoes and they don't get the exercise that they would in the wild. But they're not terribly fast oh, in the first good. place. Yeah. Oh, goodness. That's true. And if you were to look at his head, it would remind you very much of a ferret or a oh, mink or a weasel. Yes. <laughs> This is about full grown. Mm -hmm. um, he's not going to get, hopefully, he's not going to get a whole lot bigger hopefully. than this. <laughs> but he is a rather people. large animal. And what's interesting about skunks mm -hmm. is that nothing else in the area looks mm -hmm. like them. Now, of course, we're talking about animals that you could find in your backyard. How many of you have seen skunks? Of course. We've pretty much all seen skunks. They're a very common animal. You might even have them living under your shed. Um, they do quite well around human habitation, so you'll see them there. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that they're omnivores. They're going to eat just about anything that they can. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but Double Stuff here is not built for speed. So he's not going to be chasing too many things down. He's going to eat things that he can. And one of the things he does do is he uses his front feet you can see the claws on his front feet here. And those claws are designed to dig things up. They're not like a, a bear that they would use to scratch or a, a fish or cat or something. They're there to dig, and he's got a really good sense of smell. I find it quite ironic that an animal like this that smells so bad finds his way around with his nose. So, and by the way, he finds himself as offensive as everybody else does, so he does not want to spray if he doesn't have to. All right, so notice what he's doing. His nose is always sniffing. 
got terrible eyesight. Mm. He's got terrible hearing. But what he can do is find things with his nose. And he's going to go around your lawn, and he's going to find grubs and stuff right underground. He's going to use his claws to be able to scratch and dig up those grubs. So most of the things that he eats, he finds with his nose. Um, that's the other reason that he sprays, too, because he does have terrible eyesight and terrible hearing. And he does have a wonderful coloration on him. I love skunks. I think they're beautiful animals. Nothing else around here looks like a skunk. Yep. So why do they have this black and white pattern? Is that a visual first before having to use their final weapon? It's quite visual for another animal to see him, but what do the black and white stripes mean? Danger? Ah, it is a warning. Now, a lot of people will say to me, oh, it's camouflage. That would make sense, <laughs> of course. Most things would be camouflage. But I don't think he's going to blend hear. in with anything except maybe <laughs> in the middle of the road, and he's not going to want to do that. So. He is going to show off, and what he's saying is, stay away from me or you're going to smell really, really bad. And that's what he does. That's how he defends himself <laughs> with, that, um, with that smell. So in other words, there's no way we could ever release uh, double stuff into the wild because he no. has no way of defending himself. This is the only way he has to defend himself. Yes? How do you take away the spray? You know, that is a really good question that I just don't know the answer to because when we buy skunks like this, we buy them descented. And we have to get them from an out-of-state source, and it's usually somebody that has bred them for pets. And in many states, you can own skunks as pets. They do, I don't recommend wild animals for pets, but I do think that skunks have been bred in captivity for years and years and years, and they're almost a domestic animal, and they do quite well as pets. But here in Massachusetts, we cannot have them as pets. Yes? Oh, he can smell himself, and that's why he doesn't really like to smell, like to spray, because he finds himself just as, yeah, you can see he's, Ooh, we have a tickle spot cheese, right yes. here, and he, oh. yeah, oh. so if you scratch him, he is going to, <laughs> yeah. Now, double stuff would be very, very happy, just sitting in your lap all day long, being petted. Yes? Ah, good question uh -huh. on skunks, too. <laughs> Lots of people around here say, I've seen skunks that are almost completely white. Or spotted. Or Well, spotted is a little bit different. They're, they do have individual patterns on them. And there's another species of skunk called a spotted skunk. We're not going to find those around here. Spotted skunks are going to be from the western United States. You'll find Ooh. them in Arizona and New Mexico. Okay, they tend to be a little bit smaller, and they're the ones that can actually do a handstand. Oh. Yes, That's those ones. Those ones will do a handstand. handstand he's not going to do that, out. but what he would do to kind of warn you that he's going to spray is he's going to stomp his feet on the ground. Mm -mm. And he would stomp his feet down, yes. drag them back. And if you see a skunk do that, Whoa. pretty good idea to turn around and go the other direction. He'll want to back away from the skunk then. Mm -hmm. But he is really, really quite sweet. nice. And I'll tell mm. you, um, he's, he's a wonderful oh, creature yes. and very, very... Uh, I wouldn't say he's super soft though. He's kind of got kind of I a wiry he's real coat soft. to him. I yeah, love it. so he's not terribly. Oh, you like the But sometimes in this area, we'll find mm -hmm. skunks that are almost completely white. Wow. And then in other parts of the country, you'll find them that are almost completely black. Mm -hmm. So depending on where they come from, you're going to see a difference in in the white patterns on them. Um, the white streak is all yellow. Yeah, he's an old it's skunk. It's and um, we don't bleach him, so <laughs> they tend to get like this over time. You know, many, many years go by and their, their color turns from super white to kind of a yellowish color to them. Yeah. boy. Yeah, we find your tickle spot there. What's his favorite treat? Um, his favorite treat really is bugs. Oh. We give him mealworms occasionally <laughs> because in the wild they're going to eat a lot of insects in their right. diet and so we want to make sure that he gets enough um, insect protein in his diet so we'll give him some bugs occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Alrighty. let's get him back down in here. Okay. Oh, Everybody say bye, Shabbat. Double Stuff. Bye, Double Stuff. <laughs> okay. Oh, Double here Stuff. You go. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to ask you a question. Double Stuff. Who has a garden? Okay, if you have a garden, there are certain animals that you really don't want to have in your garden. So what kind of animals do we have around here, here that go. you would not want in your garden? That probably isn't going to so. Yes. Squirrels. You don't want squirrels in your garden. They're going to eat things and probably bury nuts in your garden and stuff like that. What else don't you want in your garden? 
Rabbits. Oh, mm. boy, I have such a problem with rabbits every year. Uh, we don't have a garden, but we have a flower bed, and the flowers uh, get chewed up by the... By, I couldn't believe it. All my daisies nipped right down to the buds um, by rabbits. So rabbits are wow. another animal that you wouldn't want in your garden. Gopher? Ah, gopher. Oh, now, gopher. gopher is a really kind of a, a universal <laughs> term for any type of critter that, that goes underground, right? So let's see if we can find something that might represent a gopher. Oh. Come on out, Vinny. And can I hug this one? <laughs> Come on, Vin. Here we go. All right. My goodness. There we go. Oh. Hi, Vinny. What's up, Vin? He's a woodchuck. Okay. So, what is Vinny? Oh, a beaver. Vinny he is looks a like a beaver. <laughs> He's cousin to a beaver. As a matter of fact, if you would look at him, you'd see his face. And I'll bet you, if you gave him a little piece of banana, he would he love you for the rest of your life. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Yet. There you yes. go, Vin. Okay. Good boy. If you look at his face, very much like a beaver. But beavers are much larger. Beavers are the largest North American rodent. And he's a rodent as well. But if we look at his tail, we'll notice it's not that flat tail that he would nub. use to, to swim with. And he doesn't have webs on his feet. Um, nope. He is what's known as, some people would call them gophers, but gophers, anything that goes underground would be a gopher. We call him a groundhog. I'm sure everybody knows him as a groundhog. But not just a groundhog, there's two other names that I know of for these creatures. They might call them a gopher, but what else do you think you would call them, do you know? There's a name that we call them around here. Yes? Woodchuck. 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 And as a matter of fact, it's really kind of funny how these guys got that name Woodchuck. Of course, we all know that little saying, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? But, turns out, the word woodchuck has nothing to do with chucking wood. The word woodchuck comes from the Algonquin name for this animal. They were called a wooshuck. Huh. And so that is where they got the name woodchuck. Mm -hmm. Now, Vinny here has been with me for four years now, and mm -hmm. I really happen to like him a lot. He's a great guy. He's a bit lazy, though, and we're going to find out just how lazy he is here in a second. And I think he probably wants a little more banana. He's a guy. Come on, over here. All right. Piece of banana? Boom. There you go. Oh, his belly. Here. Oh. All righty. Oh. Get a banana, and he'll hang out just like that. Okay. Oh, did you wee feet see? Now, the other thing you might notice with him is he has never learned to chew with his mouth closed. No. So he does make a mess with a banana. And I know you're probably going, banana? Really? Why banana? He wouldn't eat bananas in the wild. Well, like I said before, everything seems to <laughs> like bananas. All right, Vinny, come on up here. And a boy. Yeah, he's also okay. a burrowing rodent. So he is a burrowing rodent. He is going to collect, be able to go down underground. And these are very good engineers. They will go down. Yes. They will come back up about halfway and go across like this. And the reason for that is if they have heavy rains, the rain is going to go straight down. And it's going to go right by them. They're not going to wind up um, getting flooded out. They can also dig separate burrows out so they have an exit in case something decides that they want to come down and go after them. They can, uh, they can get out through a, a second exit. Uh, yes? Well, I would not call them pets. They are all mine, creature teachers. I do own creature teachers, and, and uh, these animals all live at my house. We have 91 animals in oh all. Oh, my goodness. But um, Vinny is, uh, we use Vinny for, for teaching. That doesn't mean I don't like him. He's a really cool animal. And my wife thinks that we look an awful lot alike, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, um, Vinny doesn't live in my house. We have buildings for these guys, and they all have their own enclosures. Um, but right now... We wouldn't see Vinny. I did see one just the other day, which kind of surprised me a little bit. But where would these guys be right now? They would be sleeping. Underground. That's right. They'd be doing something. They would be hibernating. hibernating. They're going to be hibernating. And what's strange about hibernation is that around this time of year, these guys wind up saying, you know, I don't think I should be out here right now. <laughs> There's really not a whole lot of food. And I can't afford a plane ticket to Florida, so I'm going to have to figure out something to do underground they go but now they have to go to sleep and it's not a sleep like you and i sleep it's a really mm -hmm. really deep sleep More what like they're going to do animation. it is and what happens is everything slows down in them um their heart rate slows way down their breathing slows way down even their body temperature lowers so that they mm -hmm. can make it through the winter on the body fat mm -hmm. that they've stored up over the summertime and vinnie's mm -hmm. not short of any body fat here so Vinny's got the, <laughs> Vinny has, has the hibernation thing all set, except we don't hibernate Vinny. Um, 
hibernation can be pretty tough on an animal. We don't want to put him through that. So he kind of hangs out with us. And the only time we have a problem with him is around March when he would be normally waking mm. up. He gets in a pretty bad sees, mood. She is seeing yeah. a shadow. So we just <laughs> don't, uh, yeah, we just don't. Uh, are you getting <laughs> banana all over me? No, 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 no. Yep, he does make a mess. <laughs> yes. How much food does he eat in the day? You know, that's a good question, too. And how much food <laughs> does he eat? Um... I would say that depending on the time of year, this time of year he doesn't eat a lot. He loves bananas, so we can always get him to eat a banana. But he might not eat for two or three days, and then he might eat a little bit of greens or oh, wow. maybe a little bit of, yeah. This time of year he slows way down, and he's not, he thinks he wants to hibernate, so he's just kind of getting, um, Going he, the he's motions. starting to use all that body fat that he has. All right, Vinny, you want some more of this? Okay. Now, um, Punxsutawney Here. Phil, he is the same yes. animal. Yes, Punxsutawney Phil is a gopher or groundhog or woodchuck. Oh, and also another name for them, and I never really even knew this until I started doing programs with kids, and I went and asked them if they knew what this animal was, and somebody said, oh, that's a whistle pig. Has anybody oh. ever heard of called whistle pigs? Okay. I never heard them called whistle pigs until I started doing programs with kids. Apparently, Curious George called them whistle pigs. Oh. The reason <laughs> for that is... They whistle, and they whistle for a reason. They come from a group of rodents called ground squirrels, which include marmots and 13-line ground squirrels, these guys, and prairie, prairie dogs. dogs. Yes, mm -hmm. and because prairie dogs will communicate by barking. Sure. Sure. Yep. These guys mm -hmm. communicate by <laughs> whistling. Huh. And what they would do is if they were, let's say they got in your garden, and they're eating your garden, and they see you come running at them with a big stick, they're going to let all of their neighbors know that there's danger around, and they're going to whistle. And when they whistle, everybody goes underground. So that's how they communicate. He has two white things at the um, top of his mouth. He has rodent teeth. And all rodents have two Big top insiders. teeth that are really long and two bottom teeth. And they go past each other like scissors. And so that's what he uses to do. You know, if you see where a beaver has chewed a big log, they're able to do that because of the strong teeth that they have. And many rodents <laughs> actually have orange teeth, too. These guys don't, but porcupines right. and beavers all have these big orange teeth, and that's because of the enamel that's on those teeth. Yes? Um, so in this cage, I saw him wiggle around yeah. everywhere, but now he's just staying still. Yeah. He's got a banana. He's got a banana. He's good. He's, he's good to he, go. Yeah. He <laughs> would, uh, you know, you could... You could drop something near him and it wouldn't even scare him at this point because he's he's um, got a banana, so um, he's happy. No, That's well, why we're able to take him and, and just kind of you know, <laughs> flip him over like that and he's perfectly happy eating his banana like that. Yes? So, uh, I have a kid that has long teeth. Mm -hmm. So would it be a... They are relatives. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Your hamster is in the same group of animals, of rodents, as these guys are. So hamsters are rodents as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they tend to be very nocturnal as well. These, however, are not. These guys are going to come out during the day. And so when you see them in your garden and stuff, it's usually during the day. They tend to like to come out, especially in the, the heat of the summer, they tend to come out early morning and late evening because they don't want to deal with the heat. But they are going to be out during the daytime rather than the nighttime. Now, will his incisors continue to grow like a they beaver's? They do. Most rodents, their, con their teeth will continue to grow, and so you need to give them things that are going to wear down those teeth. We give them soup bones and stuff to chew on, and that's going to help to keep his teeth down, because obviously a banana's way too soft to do anything yeah. more. Um, and he would just do this all day, given the opportunity. <laughs> so. so I never <laughs> knew that they whistled before. And that, um, the, as soon as you said that, I thought of Winnie the Pooh and the gopher that whistles all that's the time true. when he talks. Oh yeah, that's right. I never even uh, thought of that, but that's true. They do whistle. Yeah. All right. What do you say, Vinny? Now we brought a couple of turtles. Um, how many people like turtles? I love turtles. I think turtles are really neat. They're just so unique creatures. Um, and we have a lot of different types of turtles around here. Has anybody seen painted turtles, for instance? Those are probably the most common turtle we're going to see around here. They're the ones that will sit on the logs. Some people call them like sun turtles. And yellow right yes, here. they have they have kind of um, like orange and and uh, yellow around the face. They look like they've been painted, which is how they got their name, painted turtle. But their back is very dark, and the reason for that is when they're sunning themselves on the log, being a cold-blooded animal, the they dark colors going to absorb a lot of the, the heat. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not a painted turtle, by the way. And those of you who have seen these turtles before, does anybody know what kind of a turtle this is? 
Yes, snapping it's a snapping turtle. <laughs> this is indeed a snapping turtle. <laughs> and I would say to you right now, don't try this at home. If you see how I'm holding this turtle, I'm holding him right in the palm of my hand. If a, a snapping turtle can easily take his head and come all the way back here and grab onto your hand. And this one, this size, could take your finger. Absolutely. It's really, really, this is a, a very strong turtle. And they call them snapping turtles because usually they'd be snapping. Now, I did tell you earlier that we don't like to take animals out of the wild. This is an exception. This one and a couple of the other turtles we have, and I'll explain to you why. This one we decided to wind up hanging on to. We found him crossing the road. He was about the size of a quarter. I don't know how I saw him, but he was crossing the road in November. Oh. And it's way, way too late now for this turtle to get somewhere and hibernate, especially if he were just the size of a quarter. So I took him home and I said, we'll keep him for the winter. Well, when we kept him for the winter, we handled him so much that he got very tame. We started using him for some programs and he was wonderful to use for programs. So we decided to hang on to him. These are quite a common turtle. And like I said, I don't like to keep any animals out of the wild, but he is an exception. Yes? Um, it looks like he has webbed feet. He is a very strong swimmer. And if we were looking at arms. him, we would see the power in those front feet and the power in the back feet. And this is a really aquatic turtle. And by that, I mean he spends 90% of his life in the water and underwater. Unlike painted turtles, he's not going to come out and sun himself. Very seldom you'll see these out. You will, however, see them out and crossing the road certain times of the year. June, July, we might see them. Any idea why they'd be out crossing the roads? To dig a nest. Yes, they are going out there. It's usually a female. And she's usually trying to find a place to lay her eggs. And so we see them, we're going to see them crossing the road. And I can guarantee you that the sandy soil on the other side of the road is always better than it is on the side that they started from. They're going to want to cross the road. And when they do, this is when they run into problems because they're going to wind up getting hit by cars. Now, when you drive along and you see one of these in the road and you want to save it, there's certain things you want to do. If you can avoid touching him, that's the best thing in the world. If you can get something like a stick and maybe move him along the road, you can do that. If there's a lot of traffic and you absolutely have to pick him up, or her up, I should say, there's a way to do this too. First of all, you don't want to pick him up by the tail. You'll notice that she's got a long tail and it'll be very easy to pick them up by the tail. Problem with that is a turtle this size, it's really not gonna to bother too much, but as they get older, they get much heavier. And this shell, is part of her backbone. And so if you were to look on the inside of this turtle shell, it would look like the spine going right down there. And so if we were to grab her and pick her up by the tail, just the weight of her body might break her tailbone right here. And I have seen turtles that could not use their back legs because they had been picked up Aww. by the tail. So we don't want to do that. But you don't want to grab them up here because remember, there's a big snapping head there that can do some damage. So the best way to do it is to reach under here and here and lift her up like that. Yay. Now you've got the back of the shell. It's <laughs> not doing any damage to the shell. She can't really push you away with her feet even though she's trying. And we can pick her up, move her to the other side of the road, set her down and let her go. Now she doesn't have too much to worry about because <laughs> she's only got to cross that road one time to lay her eggs, maybe get back again and get back into the, the pond and then she's safe again because she's going to spend 90% of her time underwater. Yes? We have two big snapping turtles in my swamp in the backyard. Uh-huh. And when they were kids, I found them on the road mm -hmm. and I, s I didn't know how to pick them up so I... Uh, my dad helped me, and he did it that way. That oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's the way to do it, and then you get them across there. These, by the way, can live at least 50 years. Now, they're going to get big they, like they're a going tire, to get yeah? big. They are, but I will say this. 35 pounds is a really big snapping turtle. I have a lot of people that will come to me and say, I got one, had to be 150 pounds. Well, there are other turtles called alligator snapping turtles from down south. They can get up to 200 pounds. That's like huge, that though. Yes, and they are North America's largest turtle. Uh, these guys, 35 pounds is a big turtle, but it's not the huge turtle that we, we may think it is. Yes? One time when I went fishing with my dad, we saw this really big snapping turtle. Yeah, you will <laughs> see them. They'll actually kind of come up and get your fish, too. You have to watch yeah. out for that. <laughs> All right. Did you notice the long neck, too? 
This is really how they can wind up catching their food. They're going to sit on the bottom of the pond and look like a big old lump of mud. Mm -hmm. And a fish might swim by them. That big long neck is going to be able to jut out, grab that fish, and eat it. But that other snapping turtle that we were talking about, the alligator snapping mm -hmm. turtle, doesn't have a long neck. Oh. But it has a much different way to be able to do that. Tell us how we do that. Well, the alligator snapping turtle actually has a little fleshy appendage that it can use as a lure to try and draw fish and other small creatures in the water to it. So it will sit there with its mouth open forever and just dangle this little wormy thing in their mouth and it will attract creatures right into their jaws and then they'll snap. It's really cool to see. And as much as I wouldn't want to be a fish around an alligator snapping turtle, it's kind of neat to it watch cool. them do that. All right, let's get him back in here because I have a couple more that I do want to show you. Now, turtles uh, belong to a, a group called terrapins, and no other creature is in that group except for things that live in shells like turtles, just turtles. Okay. These are cool. I will say this. If you see these in your backyard, you're very, very lucky. This is a turtle that we would see here in Massachusetts, but it's very rare. I'm not even sure whether it's uh, considered um, threatened, endangered, or um, just of special concern, but there aren't a lot of these. The primary concentration of these is down on the Cape, um, but for the most part, they're very difficult to find around here and in your backyard. I have two of these. They were both given to me by the state of Massachusetts, by the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, because they got them, could not release them, and wanted them to be used for educational purposes, and so that's why I have them. You do need a very special permit for these as well, but they're gorgeous creatures, aren't and they? such pretty orange And this eyes. is called an Eastern Box Turtle. It is a male, we can tell, because he has those red eyes. He's so cute. And those red eyes indicate that he is a male. But one of the reasons that these turtles are having such a hard time here in Massachusetts is because, first of all, um, people like to get them as pets. But if you find one of these, my suggestion is to call the Fish and Game Department and let them know where you are and that you have found one of these turtles. They probably won't send somebody out, but what they will do is write it down so that they know that there are some in your area. So that's really location. good to do. Yep. Um, but you don't want to hang on to them. They are herbivores. They really, I shouldn't really say that because they do eat earthworms and stuff like that too, but primarily mm. they're eating leafy <laughs> greens and fruits and things like that, berries. Um, you can hold them if you'd like now, is, to. Is he actually considered more of a tortoise because of the way he don't yes, up and his um, funky little legs? Yeah, they he call them box turtles and, and, and there is a reason for that too. If we were to look at him here, we'd notice that. Um, well, well, we'll show you a couple of things about turtles. Turtles have a top and a bottom to their shell. The top is called the carapace and the bottom is called the plastron. And if we notice on his plastron that he's got a line right across oh, there. Yeah. That is a hinge. That's why they call him a box turtle. Oh. If we were to get him to get his head oh. in there, get 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 in there we can take what? and shut his shell just like a box. So if something like a raccoon came along and wanted to try and eat him, they'd have a very hard time doing it. He's going to put his head in, but he's going to be able to close up his box, too. So that's why they call them box turtles. That is so okay. fascinating. Now, a couple of reasons why there aren't that many of them around. One is habitat loss. Lots of houses going up and construction and stuff. and There just isn't the area that these turtles need to be able to survive. That's one of the reasons. But the other reason, we just talked about with the snapping turtle a little bit, and that is the road. Now, if we look at this turtle, this is the reason we got this turtle. You'll notice this back shell here has been completely broken. Aww. And that was from a car. He got hit by a car. No. And I have to tell you, he's a very lucky turtle. Because if you look closely, you Ooh, will see that he's got right a crack from here all the way down to the back of his shell, right down there. Hmm. And because of that, they weren't sure he was going to survive. So they kept him until they were okay with, uh, with releasing him to me, and then they gave him to me. You'll also notice that he's a different color than this one, too. And that just happens to be this particular turtle. It's what they would call melanistic, and it's almost like an uh, albino animal, but instead of having not enough of this pigment, he's got too, too much, much of the it. pigment, so he's a very dark animal. Um, they're both about the same age, and they won't get a whole lot bigger than this. But this <laughs> is another turtle that can live to be 50 years old. Wow. Yes, way back there. Um, we have a lot in our neighborhood because we have a lot of woods. 
You have a lot of woods, yeah. Mm. Well, these like woods. They like open field areas where they can get some strawberries and mm. things like that. And you will find them occasionally, but like I said, if you see them, you're quite lucky. We don't see an awful lot of these. I have never seen a wild box turtle here in Massachusetts. Wow. If you get down south, you'll find them a lot more uh, commonly. My son lives in Virginia, and he has quite a few around his house. And if you go to Florida, they're a lot more common, but we just don't seem to see them up here. Yes? Are both of these turtles Yes, they're both going to wind up eating a lot of uh, leafy greens and stuff. I will say that eastern box turtles do like a lot of insects in their diet. They'll eat grasshoppers. They'll eat, he, these guys love earthworms. Um, sometimes I'll go and buy them some, some uh, night crawlers at the fishing store and, and let them go crazy. And, and they really do. They really love it. But, uh, you know, they're a really, really neat turtle. I like the... Um interesting scales on their arms very much like armor plating. It, it, it is so and even in. if they're not going to um, put their shell up they can protect their head by going in there and then tucking those arms up over their their head and a lot of tortoises that is how they wind up um, protecting themselves. In a store I saw like a gigantic tortoise with like a <laughs> tiny ball can these like kick a ball with the head or something? I don't know why they would put that in there probably just to have them move it around a little bit yeah um, it's, I don't know that they make too many turtle toys, but, uh, you know, um, I don't know if a turtle would actually use one. But I tell you what, you guys might want to see these a little closer up. So I think that's what we'll do now is have you come up and you can take a look at them. Well, that's all the time that we have for this segment of Creature Teachers. My name is Tolly, and I'd like to thank Rick Roth of Creature Teachers in Littleton, and we will see you next time.